not sure if that's on live yet or not, or just recording. He's saying it's going. <laughs> So I'll just give it another minute. Please just settle in and relax, find a comfortable posture. While we wait for a few more people to arrive and we'll start pretty soon. Can I double check if that's really on Facebook Live? Because we usually get the notification, it usually says Facebook Live, whereas it only says recording. So. I guess we'll find out soon enough. And for anyone who's concerned about that, please don't worry. This is only me that's being recorded. So <laughs> as Ajahn Brown says, it's the one in the front seat that gets all the bugs on the windscreen. Okay, so we've got almost a full house, which is wonderful. And I've been um, quite excited for most of the afternoon, actually, about this topic, because I love to talk about loving kindness. It's such a central part of the practice from the very uh, motivation that we come to the practice for, right through to the final goal, where the heart is full of unconditional love. So the purpose of these evenings is to explore some skillful perceptions that can really help to complement the meditation on the breath. And there are different ways of looking at experience, if you like, um, which help us to overcome the hindrances to meditation. So those hindrances are things like aversion, um, sense desire, restlessness, doubt, and sloth and torpor. Now we're on live, excellent. And so, this is a really important part of the practice. It's not only mindfulness, as Ajahn Brahm was saying this morning. It's almost as though the mindfulness is like a looking glass that you use to look at experience. And it's as though that looking glass is a magnifier. So whatever it looks upon, it sees much more clearly and in a lot of detail. But if that glass is actually dirty, if it's uh, clouded or scratched, it doesn't really get a true reflection of what is looking at. It can't see clearly. So sometimes I used to talk about um, perceptions like loving kindness as a kind of color, a sort of lens, a, a sort of tinted lens that we look through. But this afternoon I thought it's actually much more accurate to think of these um, perceptions as kinds of different cleaning fluids that we actually clean the dirt off that lens because we're not overlaying our experience with with something else, we're actually taking away obstacles. So kindness is like the jiff or the sif that you, you know, clean that glass up with so that you can see more clearly and with a lot more kindness so that you're not just adding, you know, negativities onto the things that you're perceiving, which may already be difficult to bear. So the other reason that these perceptions are so important is because they constitute part of right intention or right attitude, the way we relate to whatever we're aware of. And this is the second factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. And the way that the Eightfold Noble Path works is that every preceding factor feeds into the next and feeds into the next. So every factor has to be practiced in order to um, cultivate the whole Eightfold Path. So mindfulness is only the seventh factor. And before then, we have to really align our ways of relating to experience with right intentions. One of those intentions being this beautiful loving kindness. Also the letting go and the gentleness that Ajahn Brahm spoke about this morning. It also helps to um, strengthen right effort, which is the factor, the sixth factor of the path before right mindfulness. And right effort is where we start to learn how the mind works and how to work with the mind 
skillfully to increase the wholesome qualities in our mind and to undermine unhelpful, unwholesome qualities that lead to suffering. Yeah? So by adding these beautiful perceptions, we're actually cultivating more of the path and the practice becomes much, much richer. It also provides a bit of variety. So every evening I'm going to look at a different theme. And in some cases, they may be meditations which are different from Geth meditation that you can do at different times of the day. But at other times, there'll be just particular ways of looking, particular lenses through which you look at the breath meditation. So please pick things up whichever way is helpful for you, because not one method suits everybody. And even if you find the method that seems to suit you best, it won't suit you all the time. You know, there'll be times that it works and times that it just doesn't. And one of the skills of um, being a meditator is to learn to work with however your mind is from time to time. Yeah, so to actually look in there and see what, what do I need right now? What is arising? And what are some of the antidotes to the things that are arising in the mind? I also feel that practices like loving kindness can add a lot of enjoyment to meditation because by its very nature, um, love, loving kindness, warmth, friendliness is a very pleasant emotion. It's a very pleasant experience. And as the Buddha says again and again, suki no chitam samadhi which means the mind becomes still, the happy mind becomes still. Yeah? Happiness is actually the cause for stillness. And so again, you know, as these hindrances increasingly get washed away, weakened, um, overcome, the mind gets energized and with that energy comes increased happiness, increased clarity um, and more buoyancy and softness as well. So today I wanted to talk about loving kindness, which is, of course, the most exalted kind of love that the Buddha describes in the suttas. He talks about other kinds of love which are more related to sensuality or to familial love. Um, but loving kindness is considered the purest kind and it's really a wish for the well-being and benefit of all beings. A kind of protective love, the same sort of protection that a mother would feel towards a child. So that love that just wishes for somebody's safety, for somebody's happiness, and that another being can thrive. Of course, the difference between a mother's love and real, true loving kindness is the, uh, the scope of that love. So the Buddha says that, you know, we should have the kind of loving kindness that is uh, like the love of a mother to a child to all beings. So it's this um, extension you know, the quality of expansion and extension and impartiality that really um, gives loving quality, it's lo loving kindness, it's unique quality. Yeah? And that's why it's sometimes called unconditional love because it expects nothing in return. So I wanted to talk a little bit about different ways to use loving kindness. So this reflection will only be a few minutes and before we do some practice. Um, but one of the main ways we can use it is as a cultivation in and of itself. So it can actually be another vehicle all the way into the deep meditations of jhanas by cultivating loving kindness in the mind again and again. So normally this happens in a discursive way in the beginning. So we take another human being or another being, it could even be an animal, a pet, and we send thoughts and intentions of loving kindness towards this being, continuously wishing them well, so that those words of loving kindness in the beginning become the main focus for the mind. And then we listen to where those words are pointing to, to the actual experience of loving kindness that starts to flourish in the heart. And this can be practiced at various times of the day, even if the breath meditation is your main vehicle. You can still have a few minutes or even whole sessions of the day where you just focus on loving kindness as a cultivation. And even if you don't get all the way into deep meditation through that method, the Buddha inspires us by saying that even if you cultivate loving kindness for the time it takes to pull a cow's udder 
So now you have to imagine that you're in ancient India or perhaps a farmyard, farm in Austria or somewhere, maybe in Devon, and you're pulling this cow's udder. So it doesn't take very long, right, for the milk to come out. So he says, even if you develop loving kindness for that length of time, it's, it has more benefit than giving thousands of meals to homeless people, for example. It has more benefit than, you know, enormous amounts of charity towards others. And I was thinking about this today, like, why would that be? You know, surely the most important thing is not how we feel or it's not sort of, you know, this moment of loving kindness, but actually, you know, alleviating the suffering in the world. But I think this is related to um, having loving kindness as a motivation for all our actions of body, speech and mind and the power of being aligned to that motivation which can go beyond just giving charity once or twice and can start to inform every action of body, speech and mind. Yeah. So something which is motivated by loving kindness is far, far more profitable to ourselves and to others, you know, than something that is maybe looks on the outside like kindness, but is not having that powerful effect of undermining our defilements, undermining our ill will, our greed, our delusion, which is for the higher good in the longer term so having loving kindness as an attitude is also a really beautiful practice and this can be applied at any time in the meditation with any object that arises yeah Ajahn Brown says that loving kindness is that quality that embraces the imperfections of ourself the imperfections of other people and even the imperfections of life yeah this can also extend to the imperfections of our meditation object. And if you imagine having this beautiful attitude of friendliness, of warmth, of genuine care towards everything that arises in your body and mind, then after some time, it won't be possible to even perceive these things as imperfections anymore. What starts off as something unwanted, something imperfect or irritating, when met with loving kindness, you know, when we're able to make peace, it actually turns into a friend. <clears throat> I went on a walk this afternoon because the sun came out and there was suddenly this bright blue sky above me. And towards the end of the walk, the sun was starting to set. It was only about 3.30 or 4 o'clock um, over in the Northern Hemisphere. And there were these beautiful clouds in the sky, very grey, some really heavy clouds that looked like they would about to burst and other clouds that were variegated and as the sun was starting to set and it was meeting these really dark clouds the sun's beauty was much fuller much richer and the colors were just mesmerizing and I felt that this was a good simile you know for when loving kindness meets the difficult in life it's not necessary that loving kindness is always, you know, um, happy, happy, everything's going well and the sky is blue. And this has a certain type of beauty. But when that loving kindness meets the difficulties in life, it meets the dark clouds in the mind, perhaps the depression, the anxiety or the fear. If you're really able to meet it with love, the beauty that you can perceive in such a person, the strength, the character, the richness, is so much more pronounced, so much more profound. Yeah? So when we move hand in hand in our meditation with this beautiful, um, empowering perception and intention and emotion of loving kindness, we gain this amazing strength and courage and resilience so that we can meet and befriend everything we we experience in life yeah so there's a lot more I could say about loving kindness loving kindness also makes us wise it's not only a cultivation practice or some kind of secondary meditation object as I said it's not a sugar coating that we apply on top of our emotions either it's actually very much at the heart of the practice the motivation for why we come to Buddhism in the first place to alleviate our own suffering and the suffering of others. But it can also lead to profound wisdom. And the Buddha says, you know, that once you do develop these really deep states of um, meditation based on loving kindness or any of the other Brahma Viharas, 
we can gain wisdom by understanding that even these states of mind are volitionally produced. Even these states of mind are conditioned, they are impermanent, and they will pass away. Of course, we realize that when we have a state of loving kindness, a mind which is friendly and warm, there's less suffering, so it's closer to the truth. But we still realize that this is not the final goal. And although the defilements can be overcome temporarily, um, it takes that empowered mind to really break through and see the reality of things as they are. So as Ajahn Brahm said this morning, the practice of calm and insight are not really two separate things. It's kind of like a spectrum. The deeper the calm, the deeper the insight. The deeper the insight, the deeper the calm. And I think loving kindness, you know, is, is practicing both together. It definitely brings and bestows a beautiful sense of calm. The Buddha says that one with a, a mind of loving kindness easily gets I mean, most of the time it's translated as concentrated, but I would like to say still. So one with loving kindness easily experiences states of samadhi, states of stillness and calm. Yeah. So that's my encouragement for you. And we'll do some guided meditation now. And if you have questions or you'd like to discuss loving kindness in more depth and ways how you can apply these methods during the day or during the retreat, We'll have some question time at the end, okay? So this is mainly a, a question and answer session, so you will have plenty of time for that. So, if you'd like to get yourself comfortable, and especially for the loving kindness meditation, making yourself as easeful and relaxed as you possibly can. Not necessarily using the same posture that you've been using today, but really asking your body how it feels and what it wants. Treating your body like your own best friend. And as you close your eyes, allowing the sense impressions to fade. Perhaps having a sense of the people sitting here with you, with us. As a supportive field. And also settling down into your own inner cave. Welcoming yourself into this meditation. Just as you are. with the loving kindness that asks nothing in return. But meditates just for the sake of meditation. So we're going to start meditation by becoming aware of the tips of our toes. And if it works for you, we might imagine looking after those toes as though pulling or covering them with a soft fleecy blanket. A 
as though your own feet, your toes, are like a child that you're putting down to sleep. Wrapping them in this soft, warm kindness. That soothes and relaxes. And shows your toes, your feet, that they're cared for. And in your own time, continuing to care for your legs. Imagine covering them with this soft, warm blanket of loving kindness. Receiving any sensations in the ankles, the shins, the calves and the knees. Noticing how your caring presence calms and settles any sensations down. And moving up through the thighs. Imagining pulling up this soft blanket over your thighs, bestowing warmth and care. So that your whole legs can relax, be at rest, be at ease. Moving up to the abdomen, the buttocks. Caring for any sensations that you experience in those areas. Softening any resistance in the mind. Just allowing them to be. You continue covering your torso with this soft blanket of loving kindness. Inviting all the organs in there to relax, to rest. 
appreciating that they've worked for you today. Now's the time for them to restore. And spreading loving awareness through the chest, the front and the back. Imagining your whole torso now underneath this blanket, inviting you to relax. Your arms and hands softening, loosening, letting go of all tension. Noticing any feelings or sensations of tingling, warmth, relaxation. Now moving up to the neck and the head. Imagining your neck and head supported by a beautiful, soft pillow, just the right shape for you. Inviting your head and neck to let go of any holding. Fully supported by this pillow. Allowing the jaw to relax. Perhaps even parting the lips very slightly. Relaxing the tongue. The cheeks, the nose, the eyes. Imagining all the tension from the eyes just draining down. into this pillow, into the earth. The skin on the forehead relaxing, becoming more spacious. And spreading your attention to cover the whole of the head. The 
even inviting the ears to relax. Now we're going to gently go inside the head to where the brain is suspended in the skull. And imagine that brain like a sponge that's been squeezed too tightly. Now inviting that sponge just to expand. You may find your sponge full of water, full of all the thoughts, ideas, information. And this poor sponge cannot hold all this anymore. So imagine that water just draining out of the sponge. Draining away. As the sponge gradually gets all light and fluffy. until the brain is at ease. And just gently smiling into the body. From the head all the way down. the shoulders, arms, the torso and legs. Relaxing as though you really were lying down under this beautiful soft blanket, a blanket of loving kindness and peace. you'd like to stay with this perception, just enjoying the relaxation, please do. For those who wish, I'd like to guide you in a little loving kindness meditation. Taking those same feelings of friendliness, of warmth, of ease, into the loving kindness. So we're going to start just by connecting, tuning in to any pleasant sensations in the body. Quite often, it can be helpful to notice the sensations in the area of the chest, the middle of the chest, the heart area. Other people prefer to just feel their sensations wherever they're most comfortable.
and with a feeling of goodwill towards your own physical feelings. I'm going to invite you to imagine that you're with a very dear friend. Someone who makes you smile just to recollect them. Towards whom you have a lot of friendship and warmth. A fairly simple relationship. Without passion or lust. It could be a friend, a teacher. In some cases, perhaps a parent or a child. See if you can choose someone who's not the closest person in the world. You don't have too much of an investment in, but where the relationship is one of pure good wish, good wishes. Someone who's very accepting and you feel at ease to be around. So bringing this person to mind as though they were right in front of you. You may get an image or a sense of their presence. Just enough so that you know this person is now the recipient of your loving kindness. And gently connecting with your wishes for this person. I usually use four phrases that resonate for me. I'll share those phrases, but you may choose your own. You can be creative and experimental. And imagine looking into this person's eyes or beaming at them from your heart. with the words, may you be happy. May you be free. May you be healed. May you be at peace. May you be happy. May you be free. May you be healed. May you be at peace. Once I've settled on the phrases that I wish to offer to this person, I keep repeating them to myself. Calmly, clearly, rhythmically, as though with every phrase I'm planting a seed seed of loving kindness in the rich, fertile soil of the heart. Trusting the flower of loving kindness to bloom in its own time. 
My job is to take care that I'm planting the seed carefully, lovingly, and trusting the power of the intentions of loving kindness to bear fruit. And as you repeat these phrases, connecting with the meaning of the words and pausing in the space between each phrase to notice where that intention is inclining the mind towards the direct experience of loving kindness. As though the phrase is the seed and the silence between each phrase, you shine loving awareness on that seed like the sunshine and the rain, nurturing the seed. and allowing it to sprout and to grow into a plant, into a flower, according to nature in its very own time. Staying aware of this friend, this very dear person, and imagining them receiving your loving kindness. Their face brightening, their eyes shining. their whole body and mind calming down. Notice how that feels in your heart. Gently allowing the image, the presence of this person to fade away. You may wish to offer them a gentle smile, recognition. But now it's time to say goodbye. And just tuning in to the echoes of that metta. 
the loving kindness in your own heart. Maybe a feeling of warmth, softness, perhaps very subtle or maybe strong. We'll just spend a couple of minutes with this feeling. And if you wish, you can inv invite the breath inside. Into the company of this warm, loving presence. as though your breath were another friend. Not expecting the breath to stay. But just being open and receptive. Offering your warmth and friendship to this little being who is your breath. And if the breath enjoys the presence, your gentle, loving presence, you may find the breath decides to stay. So we are coming close to the end of the meditation. I won't ring a bell. So if you're enjoying the company of your breath, your body or someone else you'd like to continue sending loving kindness towards, please do. And for those who wish to come out of the meditation and engage now in some question and answers, see if part of your mind can stay inside. With that kind, calm, quiet feeling. That you may now be feeling inside.
hands. Welcome to continue meditating or if you wish at this time to send in some questions to our co-host Anne-Marie. And this evening we thought we'd have a slightly different approach to the questions just to give you another option. So as all of you will know, we are live streaming and none of you are on camera at the moment, but we do have the live stream on speak of you. So we're going to give you the opportunity if you wish to ask the question personally, but please know that if you want to do that, you will be on the video recording. So if you would like me to read out the question, Please preface your question with the letters V, C for Ven Chanda. If you want to be brave and ask the question yourself, you can preface the question with the word me. There is another little option if you don't want to get too technical, <laughs> is that you can actually take your video off. So if you want to ask the question yourself, but you don't want your video to show, you can go to those three little buttons on your personal screen, a picture of you, and stop your video. So then you could ask, you know, in your own words, but without your video showing. So it's really up to you. I mean, it's probably easier in a sense if I ask the question, but I didn't want to um, take away that personal element because sometimes it can be, it can feel more connecting, more supportive and intimate to actually ask oneself. But please do keep the questions quite concise because we are, of course, quite a big group and uh, I'll do my best to cover most of the subjects and themes and please understand we might not get to you. So if we don't, it's not because it's a bad question. Please feel free to submit it again tomorrow or on any successive day. So I'm looking forward to having some input and some questions coming my way. Again, please keep them as short as you can um, because it will save me having to abbreviate the question. <laughs> um, but I will take everything you ask in. Okay. So I'm not going to say your names because I see your names and I want to just give you that privacy. So the first question, since childhood, I've had a digestive illness. Today, it was more painful than usual. Even though discomfort diminished, I was still in a lot of pain in my belly. How do I deal with this while meditating? Should I keep moving on to other parts of the body and ignoring the belly area in the kindfulness phase? Okay. <laughs> okay yeah so I think it really depends on how much discomfort you're in um, if you're finding that whenever your attention meets that area the pain is actually increasing then I would advise you to have a look at how you're relating to that pain because it may be that with that mindfulness is a slight resistance or aversion. In other words, some of the hindrances have crept in. And this is where it can be very useful to have the paradigm of the knower and the known, right? So we can imagine that our mind is this knower. It's actually not a thing. It may be more helpful to think of it as the knowing that then meets its object, in this case, the intestinal pain. So you have the knowing and the known and have a look if in between those two you're adding anything have a look at what the relationship is between those two because often we think we're aware but we're actually aware with an agenda to push something away so our awareness is making a deal it's saying okay i'll be aware of you as long as you relax or feel better or the pain starts to subside and this is actually a subtle kind of aversion that you're having towards that pain so see if you can just slightly soften that relationship and add some kindness and warmth in there sometimes you might even imagine that pain to be like a hurting child 
that's just come to its mommy and said, mommy, I've scuffed my knee. And at that moment, that child, you're not that child, so you don't feel the child's pain, but as a mother, you care. But your job as mother is not to say, oh, you know, that, that pain should go away. It's just to give a kiss to the child's knee, right? Just to care for it. And sometimes that's enough. So see if you can relate to that pain as like this little child that needs your care and kindness. And if that doesn't so-called work, and by work, I don't mean necessarily getting rid of the pain, but if you find the mind is still struggling, then I would suggest giving it a little bit more space. So rather than go like headlong into the pain and your awareness is really getting in there, you know, um, almost focusing on it, like a kind of, like Ajahn Brown said, like the zooming in, if that is um, intensifying or magnifying the pain, try and zoom out instead and take in some of the surrounding area as well. Because this means that you're getting more of a perspective, you're getting more of like a, a way of holding it in a wider context and you may find at that time that some parts of the body are not in pain right so one of the really nice techniques i used to practice with going chi quite a lot we would go through the body part by part but then from time to time we stay with what he calls the extremities which is the palms of the hand or the soles of the feet because those parts of the body are usually not in any serious discomfort unless you have an injury there Usually the palms of the hands are quite pleasant. There's a sort of subtle warmth or tingling sensation. So sometimes you can go to those parts of the body that are feeling quite pleasant. And from there, don't avoid that painful part, but include it in that. Okay. So I would say really experiment, not only with your relationship to it, but also with how you're holding it. I sort of think of it like um, the relationship is is the kindness you know with the relationship we're always trying to add kindness but the way we handle it is more like the gentleness yeah these two sides of right intention the kindness the gentleness and the letting go so three sorry but the ones i'm talking about are the kindness the way you relate and the gentleness which is more like the way you handle it so it's like how close do you want to be how wide an area do you want to take in and how long also do you want to stay there? So there's no right or wrong. It's very experimental, but, um, and it's very individual. You know, it might change for you during the day. If you're really struggling with anything, again, I hope that this loving kindness practice may give you another method just to really take some time to care for yourself you know, and, and just say, may I be happy. Today we practice with a loved person because that's generally easier. A lot of us have a lot of, uh, or some at least, self um i wouldn't say self-hate but it can be that strong certainly there's a a lot of a sense of a lack of worth or a lack of worthiness um some of us struggle with you know what's dubbed these days in meditation circles as the inner tyrant so there can be a lot of you know ill will towards oneself so you know have a look if that's there and maybe do some meta towards yourself because that can also be very healing and relaxing and help you with the pain. So, I lost the title. Just reading it first. Okay, so someone's saying that when their mind gets calm and still, now you've used the word concentration here, so this is why, this is one little clue for me. So you're saying that when your mind gets calm and concentration gets better, the body lifts up and the energy seems to move upwards and it goes up into your eyelids and they start to flicker, pulling your attention towards your eyes. Then it brings tension and you try to relax, but this keeps you away from the breath. Okay, so one thing here could be that you're trying a little bit too hard to focus or to concentrate because you use that word concentration so i'm just wondering if that might be part of it and i would say in that case perhaps when you begin the meditation to make your main inclination one of letting go rather than one of really focusing so it's a subtle difference but it's looking more at what you can put down anything that isn't the breath 
So letting go of burdens and just allowing the mind to naturally come to a place of stillness without honing in, so to speak, on the breath. So often when we hone in on the breath, because the breath is in the area of the face, it brings a lot of energy upwards to that face area. And especially if you're concentrating using the head, the mind, then it's likely the eyes may become a little bit tense and that can cause some flickering there. So trying to just stay a little bit less uh, one pointed so that the awareness is a little bit broader is my first suggestion. The second thing that could be happening there is that you are moving towards a deeper state of stillness. And I've noticed some meditators do have that flickering eyelids at that time. If that's the case, I would say, try to take your awareness away from the eyelids. Try not to get distracted by that because it doesn't really matter. Sometimes the body is just doing what it has to do. It could be some excess energy coming out that way, especially, like I say, if there's you know, a lot of focus in that area, it could be just some excess energy, or it could even be that you know, perhaps some light is starting to come into the mind. And your eyes are getting confused thinking that the sunlight's shining on you or something. So I would say don't give this too much attention. Try to stay with, a, with the feeling of calm and make the calm and the letting go and the just relaxing the main object of your meditation at that time. See if that helps. I hope that made some sense. It's uh, sometimes hard to answer the questions when... Uh, I don't get the feedback, but I also want to get through as many as we can. So if anything isn't covered properly or doesn't make sense, you can always ask again. Okay. So someone's asked a very similar question. So I'm going to skip that one for now. And hopefully the last one uh, covered that to a degree. So someone's asking about walking meditation. When you were doing walking meditation, you found that the mind was focusing on the movement of the legs and not just the feet. How would you recommend to proceed from here, please? Should I try to zoom into the feet's movements? No, I wouldn't say so. I think with meditation, it's a really natural organic process. And if your mind wants to be with the legs, then that's where it wants to be. Just trust your mind and let it go with whatever you know, um, object comes to its awareness. Um, especially in the beginning, I think that, you know, we've, we, most of us are having pretty busy lives, even if we're not able to travel or do as much uh, physically anymore. A lot of my life, at least, is very busy with online stuff. And, you know, my mind can be quite active. So sometimes it's really helpful to come back into the walking meditation, especially because it gives you more to be aware of. So if your mind wants that kind of sense of spaciousness and it, it's interested in the whole legs, then please allow it to be. And you may find that when the mind calms down, it will naturally settle into perhaps the feet. But for some people, it might stay with the whole body or it may even expand to include, you know, everything. So it's very individual. The main thing to look at is, is the mind calming down? Is this helping the mind to become present, to become still? Are you enjoying the meditation? What brings the mind greater ease? So you can practice that way. And we're all so unique. The practice is never the same for any of us, comparing ourselves with others, but also for ourselves. It's different every time. So I hope that uh, helps with the walking meditation and uh, please do ask if anyone else has questions on the walking meditation because there are many ways to to practice but I think the main thing about walking is that it gives you a break from sitting it's just a different posture to bring that mindfulness and that continuity of practice into which can be very helpful in terms of applying meditation in your daily life so even if you don't take like a formal uh, period for walking meditation you can practice when you're on the way to the bathroom or when you're on the way to the kitchen or upstairs. These are all periods where your body is moving and you can just be aware of whatever is most predominant to you at that time. So 
The next question is about loving kindness. Can loving kindness be used to let go and be kind to experiences like thoughts and emotions in daily life? In breath meditation and body relaxation that Adrian Brown taught earlier today. Or is loving kindness different than letting go? I think loving kindness and letting go are one, of the one and the same thing. They're different aspects of, uh, of the same thing. Because real loving kindness doesn't even have an object, doesn't even have an owner. I'm glad that that came up because I've got this beautiful quote by Ajahn Brahm here, which I think kind of surmises the depth of loving kindness, the potential of it. He says, understand the place of love in a spiritual life. A powerful and blissful type of love that has no conditions, no ownership, and no people involved. So the real love is the kind of love that frees, the love that lets things go, that even lets go of the object of loving kindness and just allows that energy of loving kindness to take over the body and mind. So loving kindness, can it be used to let go and be kind to experiences? Absolutely. Thoughts and emotions in daily life. And this is where I was talking about loving kindness as an attitude, as a motivation or way of relating to our experience. So I had my own uh, three month retreat recently in uh, this little house in Oxford, which is the first uh, bikuni dwelling that we've ever had in England. And um, I was practicing loving kindness every day, at least a couple of times. There wasn't any particularly fixed routine. Um, but I made loving kindness an ongoing theme because, as I say, it's so much part of the way that we should be aware of every experience. And I noticed as time went by that there was an increased disinclination to follow negative pathways in my mind. It was as though... I had so much inner well-being and contentment starting to come up through the practice of meditation and letting go. That there was almost like a protective mechanism that prevented my mind from wanting to stray into anything that was harmful or hurtful in my mind. So sometimes, for example, a thought would come up, like just a thought of lack or a thought of, you know, mm, it's good, but it's a shame I'm not in Perth. <laughs> Usually I'm in Perth for my three months range retreats every year with Ajahn Brahm. And of course, you know, this is my root Sangha. This is my spiritual home. And this time I couldn't go because of the COVID. So just once in a while, this sort of thought would start to bobble up like, oh, you know, if I was there. And I noticed it and it was almost as though something automatic would kick in and just take me down another route. Immediately another thought would arise that, but this is wonderful. You've got this space, you know, you have so much solitude and, and it wasn't kind of trying to talk myself out of anything negative. It was a genuine sense of gratitude and love that would arise. And I found this really interesting because as the Buddha says in the, um, I think it's the Vitaka Santana Sutta, he says, anything that we frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of our mind. So if we train our mind to think in, in wholesome ways and we repeatedly practice loving kindness, we're training our mind to think in positive ways. And when it's really needed, you'll find that loving kindness, that way of relating will just arise in the mind. It is also part of that protective power of loving kindness that it prevents us from harm. It protects us not only from harm from other beings, but from harm within our own mind. So loving kindness tends to spill over. And I think I can't recommend formal loving kindness practice enough. I don't know, because it's hard to ask a group of this size how that practice was for you just then. And we also spent quite a lot of time on the preparation, going through the body and uh, tilling the soil, if you like, before we started planting the seeds of metta. But uh, sometimes you can think, you know, when you're repeating these phrases that you're just on some kind of automatic, like you're like a robot, just may I be happy, may I be well, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but actually, it's very powerful because at that moment that you're having a thought of loving kindness, there's no possibility for a negative thought to arise. 
Yeah. So at that moment, you're actually inclining the mind in a wholesome direction and you are cultivating the roots of, um, of goodness, the roots of loving kindness in your mind. We don't know when they'll bear fruit, but you can really trust that they will. And you'll be surprised just when they may pop up to help you. So, okay, that's a good one. Where does metta fit into the seven factors of enlightenment? Hmm. That's an interesting one because it's not literally listed as one of the seven factors of enlightenment. But the seven factors of enlightenment start with mindfulness. And as I was saying before, mindfulness is the seventh factor of the Eightfold Noble Path. So there are eight factors there. And in order to um, cultivate the seven factors of enlightenment, you need all eight factors of the path. So by the time we get to right mindfulness, the Eightfold Path assumes at least preliminary right view. So at least an appreciation that there is suffering and there is a cause of suffering. There is an end to suffering and there is a path towards that end. And right there with right view, I feel that compassion should arise. There should be a sense of appreciation that all beings suffer, yet all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. And this is actually a phrase straight from the suttas that's part of the gradual training. But in this particular sutta, it's Majjhima Nikaya number 51, for anyone who's interested, the Kandaraka Sutta. In this particular sutta, that is the beginning of the gradual training, this recognition that all beings desire happiness and recoil from pain. And so compassion is there from the outset as the motivation for practice. And from there, one then starts to develop virtue, sila. Yeah? So motivated by this right intention, one purifies the acts of body and speech. The next factor's on the path. And by the time we continue on the path, we get to the right effort, and we start to actually learn how to work with our mind in order to rouse wholesome states and maintain those wholesome states and to actually prevent unwholesome states coming into the mind and to abandon the arisen unwholesome states. So by then we already have some skill in learning to work with the mind and that metta is already present. So in a sense you could say that the sati, the first factor of enlightenment, is already imbued with loving kindness. Yeah? The sati should include loving kindness. I really rebel from this idea of bare awareness because so often in the so-called insight traditions, which I was also you know, embedded in for a good 14 years of my practice life, or at least 10 years, I guess, without a lot of emphasis on samadhi practice, and we used to hear a lot about bare awareness and just being equanimous. But after a while, I started to realize that the way we're aware depends on our conditioning. <laughs> so we're bringing our conditioning into the way we perceive things. So if we have like a lot of, say, self-hatred, yes, you can be aware of the feelings and the thoughts arising in the body and mind, but there may be this subtle agenda or not so subtle agenda to get rid of them. You may have this idea that, you know, you've come to spiritual practice because actually you don't like yourself very much and you want to improve yourself or even get rid of certain traumas or certain um, characteristics that you dislike. And whilst this seems on the one hand as a fairly wholesome aspiration, be very, very careful because the spiritual path is not to cure you. It's not to change the way you are. It's actually to understand the way we are, to understand our conditioning, to understand why we suffer and what increases that suffering, how we can come out of suffering, you know, and how we can cultivate happiness. So it's not really about changing ourselves or being anything different or being better in any way. It's actually about understanding in order to, and, and from that understanding, we learn to let go. Now, I don't know where all that came from because this question was much more concise than that. <laughs> but I think I was talking about the sati and how the metta is an important part of that. 
So as I said, it helps to undermine the hindrances. And then in the seven factors of enlightenment, from that sati, we go into the investigation of the dhammas, which is again, similar to the right effort, noticing, you know, what is leading to the wholesome states arising, what is leading to the unwholesome states arising, and having some discernment about which pathway we want to follow in our mind. And from there, in the seven factors of enlightenment, it actually talks about stages leading up to samadhi. So it's talking about um, joy and rapture and tranquility, happiness and equanimity. So these are all stages that are leading to samadhi. So in a way, it's quite similar, again, to the Eightfold Path. It's just a different way of putting it. And from the mindfulness, one then takes that practice more and more deeply into the samadhi until the equanimity is purified in the fourth jhana. That's the peak of equanimity is in the fourth jhana. I hope that's not getting too technical <laughs> for people here, but I know that we have people who are complete beginners to meditation or to meditation retreats, as well as people who've been practicing a long time. So please don't think you have to remember or even understand all of this. Just listen, take it in, and whatever is important will stick. Whatever's not important, just leave it aside. Okay. What practice or action do we take when judgment or harshness keeps going round and round of not doing enough, not being enough, related to practice? Yeah. So it's along the same sort of theme that I was discussing before. So of course this loving kindness is very um, helpful. But I also think that the practice of contentment is another helpful tool. And I will be talking, excuse me, about contentment um, during one of these evening sessions. Um, again, it's related to loving kindness. The uh, phrases that I really love in the loving kindness in the Karaniya Metta Sutta is that uh, one of the qualities of someone with loving kindness is that they are contented and easily satisfied not proud and demanding in nature. So this is part of loving kindness, accepting how we are, accepting that we actually don't need to be good enough, we already are good enough. What we have right here, who we are right now, is already good enough. There's this beautiful talk from Ajahn Brahm. I'm obviously listening to too many of his talks, <laughs> but I can hear him speaking as, I, as I'm speaking now. And there's this wonderful talk where he says, it's only Mara that told you you weren't good enough. The Buddha said you're already good enough. And it's just one of those phrases that jumps out at me every time because like most people in the West, I've been conditioned to think I have to be perfect, I have to give more, I have to be more, I have to understand more, you know, be better, be better, be better. And whenever is it going to be good enough? One of the good things about being asked to start this project and to get kind of kicked into teaching <laughs> is that it is a kind of full immersion experience. I would have never started teaching unless my teacher asked me to so basically it has to be good enough because this is what you're gonna get you know I can't be any different I can't I can't be at a higher stage than I'm at, than I'm at already but what I can do is share some of what I understand and some of what where I'm at and hope that that might help some of you where you're at you know and that is good enough it has to be good enough because it's conditioned right I may wish I was in already enlightened, but the conditions haven't come together yet. So when we start to understand that, you know, we are good enough, we are a product of everything we've ever heard, learned, taught, thought, read, um, the opportunities that we've had, the privileges that we've had, we're actually perfect in that sense, the way we are. It couldn't be any different. So, one of the meditations related to contentment is just popping in a few words every now and then in your meditation, just to say to yourself, this is good enough. And to really start to sense and believe that it really is good enough. So especially if you see yourself craving, wanting to be further, being unsatisfied with where you are, 
see that, notice it, and just catch yourself there. And then you may choose to just, in a sense, like, what do you call it, like cut the loop. What do you call it when you like um, break the circuit and just add in a word like good enough? Again, you can also add in that loving kindness, especially towards yourself. Take a moment to see, oh, I'm hurting right now. I'm being harsh to myself right now. Oh, my dear, you're good enough. You're absolutely fine the way you are. I care for you. I value you. And these words might sound very strange when you first use them. It might sound corny or like kind of, ooh. But after a while, you actually start to hear those words and it can shift something. It's amazing how when you get the intention right, that extra little bit of kindness or compassion, suddenly everything can fall into place. So just try that. But don't try too hard. <laughs> There's so many questions, so I'm going to... Um, Oh gosh, some of them are really long, so I really do encourage you to please shorten them because it just means it's going to be easier for me to read and more likely that I'll come to your question. Um, I'm going to, let's see. Uh, so please bear with me because it's kind of hard to sort through the questions when they're all in a row. I see there's many, many questions here. Okay, I think I'll go to this one on the breath. So how do I find that? Okay, so when doing breath meditation, I can know that the breath is long, short, etc. But this involves internal dialogue. Or I can feel the breath, which is quite pleasant. But then I don't seem to get a view on the length of the breath. Is there a third option? I've not found it yet. <laughs> Yeah, um, <clears throat> it sounds like your mind's quite sharp to be able to differentiate that because I think it's quite a subtle difference. I mean, for myself, I tend to feel the breath, but I can sort of sense its length. I don't have to know how long it is. I don't have to actually judge it as such and give it a label long or short. As Ajahn Brown said this morning, these um, descriptions of the breath are more like to give you something to get a handle on the breath, to kind of add a factor of interest in there so that the breath can captivate your mind. Because the breath basically, especially if we don't have a lot of loving kindness or gentleness, is sometimes quite boring in the beginning. So the idea of long or short is just to give you something to be aware of, but you don't actually need to judge it as long or short or really label it at all. The idea is just to give you something that you can be more continuously aware of. So if you're feeling the breath from the start to the finish, that's already very, very good. You know, your mindfulness is already quite, quite strong. So if you're feeling the breath and it's quite pleasant, then that's fine. That's absolutely perfect. You don't need to kind of take a step backwards and, and uh, I mean, it's not really forward or backwards, but you don't need to make sure that all the boxes are ticked. The whole idea about these instructions is to open your mind up to receive the breath and to start to learn to be with that breath and to experience it more and more fully to the point where we become really absorbed and interested in the breath. So if that's already happening and you're actually experiencing a certain amount of pleasure or delight, then you're doing fine, you know, you're on the right track. So just uh, enjoy that. And generally the meditation is a process of simplifying. So whatever helps to calm and simplify and settle the mind is absolutely fine. So gosh, lots more questions. Okay, I'm going to one on loving kindness now, if I can get it up. Uh, maybe this one and then perhaps one more. When I was focusing on giving loving kindness to the other person, I was quite emotional as it brought sadness when you mentioned seeing the other person smiling, receiving it. How can I bring myself back to the moment without my mind wandering off? 
please don't bring yourself back. You're in the moment and your heart's just open. So that's very beautiful. Yeah. Generally speaking, I guess, with this whole practice of meditation, it's much less technical than it is an emotional process. It's a feely, feely kind of path. <laughs> and it's not just because I'm a nun, because I'm female that I'm saying that. Ajahn Brahm talks about that. He says the deep meditations are emotional states. And he is a very sort of balanced person, very sort of in touch in a sense with his feminine side. So this is the whole thing with loving kindness. It's a softening of the heart. And quite often it does lead to a release of emotions. And that's very beautiful. I often have a tear with loving kindness and I just trust that, I go with that. Um, so that sounds to me very nice. So I don't think you're really wandering off. Um, and certainly if you, know, if you feel you have to force yourself back and it's hard to get back, then that shows you're actually fighting a natural process. When your mind wants to come back, back, so to speak, <laughs> whether that means picking up the phrases again or just staying with the feeling of loving kindness, it will do. So just allow that to happen. And along the way, embracing any emotions that arise. You know, as I said, there's the formal practice of loving kindness, which is what we were doing. But there's also the attitude of loving kindness. So when other emotions arise throughout, whether the breath meditation or, or during the metta meditation practice, whatever arises, include that in your loving kindness. Earlier today also, I was thinking about this word impartiality, because often we say loving kindness is impartial in the sense that it spreads to all beings equally. But I thought that word is a little bit on the kind of cold side, like being impartial can sort of infer that we, we don't care too much. And I thought a much nicer word would be inclusive instead of impartial. And that also explains that sense of meta as being all encompassing and embracing of every, not only every being, but every experience that we have in life, every emotional state. So whatever's arising for you, just include that in the loving kindness. Even if it's anger, right? Of course, anger is not a state of loving kindness, but you can relate to anger with kindness. If you relate to anger with anger, it's what we call double dukkha, double suffering. So there's a lot we can do with the way we're aware. Okay, it says here that there's 16 new messages. <laughs> so I'm really sorry that I don't get to all of you, but um, it's almost nine and I'm going to do one more because I like to kind of, uh, I don't like to go too far over time, but I definitely don't want to shortchange you either. So I hope that my co-hosts will oblige. <laughs> and uh, if anyone has to go, please uh, feel free to do that. It's almost nine o'clock. I'll just go to the question that's right in front of me now. Okay, so it seems easier to do metta when it's guided, but when I'm practicing by myself, I can only reach the loving person. Then a lot of thoughts arise. What would you advise? Yeah, so I'm not sure what you mean exactly by reach the loving person and then the thoughts arise. Um, I'm guessing that once the, love, the loving person has come up in your mind, you find it hard to maintain the focus on that person and you basically get distracted from your meditation object in the same way that when we first start working with the breath, we are able to stay with the breath, maybe for like half a breath or maybe a breath or two and then boom, gone two hours later or maybe <laughs> 10 minutes later, you're like, oh, I'm sure I was doing breath meditation. So it can happen with the loving kindness as well. So this is just natural and please don't worry about it too much. But what I, I find personally helpful is um, to adapt the phrases according to how busy or how still my mind is at any given time. So if, for example, my mind is quite restless, I might say the phrases a little bit more frequently. So I might not pause too long between each phrase. 
because in that pause, the mind can wander away. If the mind starts to become more peaceful, then I might have a longer gap between each phrase. So may you be happy. And then I can just flow with that for a while. Just allow the mind to follow the echo of that thought as though that, that thought is a signpost and I'm just letting the mind follow it. And then if I can sustain my awareness in that way, then I'll add the next thought. And if the mind becomes very calm, then I may even drop the thought just to maybe a word or two instead of may I be happy, it might just be happy. And then after a while, peaceful. So if your mind's busier, I would say put the thoughts in more frequently, more regularly, but also please try to connect with the meaning of those thoughts so that when you have that image of that person there, imagine you're actually saying this to that person. Yeah, you're not just thinking it. You're actually speaking to this person and you really mean what you say. And in that way, it might be easier to sustain that little internal monologue, which you can imagine is like a dialogue, a sort of gift in, in a way to your friend. So this may help. But like with any meditation, it's always this balance, you know, of making just the right amount of effort, not trying too hard. So if it starts to feel like a burden and a bind, then perhaps your mind's not in the mood for loving kindness and you can do something else instead. Yeah? So try to do the loving kindness at times of day, the day when you really feel like doing loving kindness. For example, it can be easy to do first thing in the morning when you wake. It's a really good time to remember how fortunate I am to have woken up this morning, how grateful I am to be alive. May I be happy. May all beings be happy. May all beings who I come into contact with today or all beings in this Zoom room, may they all be happy and well. May they not suffer. May they be peaceful. May they be successful in their meditation. So you can have these lovely thoughts as soon as you wake up in the day and also in the evening before you go to bed. It's a really beautiful time to practice loving kindness meditation. And of course you are lying down at that time. So I find it really beautiful to actually lie down and do the body scan, relax myself and then just generate these good thoughts and intentions of loving kindness to myself or to all beings. However, you know, that loving kindness feels natural and uh, helpful to me at that time and the Buddha said you know one who practices loving kindness sleeps easily sleeps deeply and doesn't have any bad dreams so it's a very restorative and healing practice and I can certainly say that it works for me I tend to sleep better when I've been practicing loving kindness so find times of the day when you're really in the mood for that I would say yeah so it's nine o'clock now and it's been a long day so i'm hoping i haven't missed really important questions for example ooh, i don't see more questions now for example around how you've been today i hope you've been fine during the personal practice period that was one thing that i would have liked to be able to ask people here um just to round up the day and to offer some advice for that, I would say, like Ajahn said, you know, don't have high expectations of yourself, not today and not for any of these days, really. And to try to use the personal practice period in the best way you can for your own self-care. So asking yourself, you know, what is the, how can I show myself some loving kindness right now? What would that mean? Would that mean having a cup of tea, eating a little bit more or a little bit less? Perhaps that would mean going out on a walk and having a look at the beautiful autumnal colours or enjoying the little bit of sunshine that we get. Perhaps it would mean having a really long rest. I had a lovely rest after lunch. Perhaps it would mean doing some walking meditation or even having a routine. Some people benefit from that. But always look at it in terms of what is for your benefit, not what you should be doing or how you can get ahead. Yeah? And if you're coming from that place, from that beautiful intention of loving kindness, from the motivation of compassion that alleviates your suffering, then you really can't go wrong. 
So you'll probably notice as this week continues that Ajahn and myself, I mean, I'm his student, so <laughs> are both quite gentle and uh, have a very relaxed approach because it's a much more uh, encouraging way to be with the practice. The last thing you need is another tyrant telling you how to be and what to do and how to improve. We have enough inner tyrants within ourselves. So whenever you catch that inner tyrant, just remind yourself, oh, is this aligned with the second factor of the noble path? Is this really the intention of kindness, gentleness, and letting go? Or is this coming from a place of ill will, aversion, harshness, yeah, and clinging, craving for results? So not to judge yourself for that, but just to keep on inclining the mind in wholesome directions and then you really can't go wrong. Okay, so I think uh, the day is over for me at least and for, perhaps for you, you may like to continue or just relax. Uh, again, really encourage you to maintain the silence to support this going inward so that you feel that you have a space within yourself that you can keep on coming into as best you can. Okay, so we're going to end the meeting. Normally in my Zoom sessions, we all wave goodbye and say good night, but <laughs> we can do that virtually in a, a noble silence kind of way. <laughs> um,